I'd like to uh, uh, thank Bill for organizing this and, and Josh uh, for giving me the opportunity to participate. Um, my comments um, basically um, uh, come from uh, a point uh, a point of view of a biologist who is also a Christian, who has been an advocate for science education, um, and also has been very active in making the case for the integrity of teaching evolution in our public schools. Uh, I've testified in a couple of federal trials. I've written three popular books uh, devoted to public understanding of evolution. And I'm also the author of a very widely used high school general biology textbook as well. Uh, so these are my concerns. Uh, and it's around these that I'm basically framing uh, my comments on Josh's remarkable book. Um, the focus here, of course, as the title suggests, is the genealogical Adam and Eve. Uh, and I think this is a good place to start in terms of public understanding, not just of evolution, but of science itself. And I would say that the Genesis story of Adam and Eve matters. Uh, and it matters a lot, not just to Christians, but to people of all Abrahamic faiths. It matters because first of all, it links our species to the divine. In other words, it takes pro the profanity of human existence and links it to the sacred. Um, it also, um, for many people, speaks to the authority of scripture. And many Bible-believing Christians, of course, believe that for scripture to be true in all of its parts, um, the Adam and Eve story must be true as well. It is also, and I recognize this as a biologist in particular, it is the basis of a claim that species are fixed and unchangeable. And one sees this running throughout the literature, uh, that appears today in opposition to evolution. And as such, the Adam and Eve story on its face is fundamentally in conflict with evolution. That is the issue that I think Josh has tried to resolve. Now, kudos first. Uh, Dr. Swamidas makes an important distinction between genetic ancestry and genealogical ancestry. And understanding this distinction is at the very heart of the scientific argument which he wishes to make. I have two parents. I had four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and 16 great-great-grandparents. This is a common human experience. As we go backwards in time, in effect, we find ourselves related by descent to more and more people. Now, if you extrapolate back far enough, let's take, for example, the hypothesis that there were two individuals 6,000 years ago. Uh, roughly 300 human generations have passed in 6,000 years. Uh, how many individuals could have been produced over that time? The answer is a very large number, which is two times 10 to the 90th power, um, which is an extraordinarily large number. So the notion that literally everyone on earth could be by genealogical descent related to two people who lived only 6,000 years ago is in fact scientifically valid. And this is at the heart of Dr. Swamidas's thesis. Now here's an important point uh, in biological terms. A 10th generation descendant of one individual would only carry uh, two to the 10th, one over two to the 10th power or about one one thousandth of the DNA, the genetic information of their ancestor. But that person would nonetheless be a descendant of that ancestor in every respect. Look today at the people who proudly claim to be the descendants of people who came over on the, on the Mayflower or the descendants of George Washington and so forth. Therefore, literally everyone on earth could scientifically be a genuine descendant of a couple that lived about 6,000 years ago. Even if that couple had become what Dr. Swamidas calls genetic ghosts by that time. And the term genetic ghost here is significant because it means that the actual DNA of that couple would have been so diluted by interbreeding with other people who also qualify as ancestors that there'd be very little genetic trace 
of that one particular couple or any particular couple who was an uh, ancestor at that point. Now, the Swamidas solution to harmonize science and faith is this, and you've heard quite a bit about it from the previous speaker, and that is that there were two divinely created humans in the garden prior to their expulsion. Outside the garden, there was a community of humans produced by the process of evolution. And here's a fanciful illustration of what human life might have been like, highly speculative, I would point out, in the Pleistocene. Um, what this does is to uh, uh, basically say, and this is part of Dr. Swami Das's solution, that humans today are a mixture in terms of descent of the sacred and the profane. We all descend from that first couple, but we also were all produced by the process of evolution. Now, modern humans, therefore, are indeed, in his view, the genealogical descendants of divinely created Adam and Eve. However, we are also the genetic descendants of evolved humans who originated outside of Eden. These are the pre-Adamites that you've heard about. And this wonderful little diagram from Dr. Swamiras's book, I think sort of sums it up. There are those two in the garden, they fall, those outside the garden contribute their genetic information to each of us today. But the important point here for me as a biologist is the vast majority, in fact, not just majority, but the, the overwhelming amount of our own genetic ancestry comes from these people produced by evolution and outside of the garden. Now, I'll be brief. This is a creative, in fact, even an heroic attempt to rescue the Genesis narrative. Um, I'm not a Bible scholar. I will leave that to the others on this panel. I certainly find absolutely nothing in scripture that argues against it. And I think that was a point made by the previous speaker. I don't find much in scripture that supports it, but again, this is not my field. As a scientist, I can say that the argument that Dr. Swamidas makes with respect to genealogical as, as opposed to genetic ancestry is perfectly valid. However, it's got problems. First of all, I would argue that it's needlessly complex. I would also point out, and I have been involved in, uh, you might say, struggles with modern biblical creationists today. This formulation is not going to satisfy the very substantial anti-evolution movement in the United States today. Um, it also has a scientific problem for me as a Christian which is in its effort to say that the Adam and Eve story is correct, it ignores the false genitive narrative of natural history in which the Adam and Eve narrative is in fact embedded. And finally, and this is the most important thing for me as a Christian, I think it's theologically unnecessary. So let me make these points briefly. It really is a highly complex narrative. It involves making the distinction between genetic ancestry and genealogical ancestry, it involves the concept of genetic ghosts. It points out that all of us possess multiple ancestries. And it also relies biblically on a pre-Adamite population. And I've included uh, just a few of the wonderful and very interesting diagrams in Dr. Swamidas's book, which I recommend to everyone attending this session. But I think you can see that this is not a simple idea. It's both scientifically and biblically complex. Now, I can say from my own encounters, and this includes debates, uh, it includes uh, basically panel discussions, it even includes testimony as an expert witness in two federal trials, including the landmark Kitz Miller versus Dover trial 15 years ago, that today's creationists or even intelligent design advocates simply will not accept any non-human biological ancestry for our species. The images that you see here are some slides from my own talks in which I have tried when I speak to lay audiences to explain how powerful and how absolutely overwhelming the molecular evidence is for our common ancestry with other organisms, particularly the great apes of which we are one. But I can assert um, that in fact, uh, today's creationists who are the, the spearhead of the anti-evolution movement, they're not gonna buy any of this. So even the watered down concept that Dr. Swamidas proposes, uh, because it includes a majority 
of non-human ancestry in our own DNA is not going to be acceptable to today's primary opponents of the theory of evolution. As a biologist, this bothers me a lot. Adam and Eve are embedded in a demonstrably false narrative in terms of geology and natural history. And I'm not gonna go into comparing Genesis one and Genesis two, which is rather easy to do, but just look at the sequence in Genesis one, which has the clearest day by day account of creation. Uh, light is created, uh, the sky is created, then we get dry land plants and trees, and those plants are somehow flourishing without the presence of the sun. Uh, I would also note that uh, even a Thunaveri like John Calvin noted that Genesis says that God made a great light, the sun, to rule the day, and a lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. When modern astronomy or semi-modern astronomy showed that the moon, in fact, wasn't a light, it was a reflector, Calvin considered that a threat to the literal nature, or literal reading of Genesis. He tried to explain it by saying that Genesis spoke to the people for whom it was written, uh, given the concept of cosmology in that time, and therefore a scientific mistake of not realizing the moon was not luminous on its own was not a fatal error. Uh, and then finally, we have creatures that live in the sea and creatures that fly, and those creatures that fly are created uh, a day before we have creatures that live on the land. The evolutionary sequence shows very clearly that there were creatures on the land who gave rise to creatures who fly. So if you're going to try to, rec uh, to rescue Adam and Eve scientifically from that narrative, you're going to have to do something about the false natural history narrative uh, that basically doesn't match with science at all. Now, my bottom line is this, and this is a, uh, as I mentioned, a heroic and a well-meaning effort to harmonize scripture with evolutionary science. I don't think it's theologically necessary. And I'll cite two sources, one religious and one scientific. The person you see here is George Lemaitre, a Belgian uh, mathematician and physicist, also a priest, who is generally acknowledged, he's getting more credit these days, and I appreciate that, as the father, the theoretical father of the Big Bang. And Lemaitre realized that Einstein's equations of general relativity implied an expanding universe. And when he was quizzed about this, about the fact that the Big Bang, the expanding universe, doesn't seem to appear in Genesis, here was his response. He said, the writers of the Bible were illuminated on the question of salvation. But on other questions, they were just as wise or ignorant as those of their generation. That includes science. Hence, he said, it is utterly unimportant if errors of historic and scientific fact are found in the Bible, especially if those errors relate to events that were not directly observed by those who wrote about them. And I think it is safe to say that the author or authors of Genesis were not there to observe the creation of the universe. And that was Lemaitre's point. I would go further and cite a scientist. This is Theodosius Dobzhansky, probably the single greatest evolutionary geneticist of the 20th century. Lemaitre wrote an, an extraordinary article um, and the title says it all. To me as a biologist, this is my Bible. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And in that article, he wrote that the organic diversity of life becomes, however, reasonable and understandable if the creator made the living world, not by caprice, and I would say not by special creation or intelligent design, but by evolution propelled by natural selection. He then said, it is wrong to hold creation and evolution as mutually exclusive. Um, and then he said, I, Dobzhansky, am a creationist and an evolutionist because Dobzhansky was a Christian. And he ended this, evolution is God's or nature's method of creation Creation is not an event that happened in 4004 BC. It is a process that began some 10 billion years ago and is still underway today. And the notion of a continuing creation and seeing the process of evolution as God's mechanism by which the world he wanted to come into existence was made, for me, is the heart and soul of how I find compatibility between scientific reason and my own faith. Thanks very much.